The first few days of the Yom Kippur War were among the most disastrous and devastating days in Israel's history. Thanks to an unprecedented intelligence failure that we detailed, of course, in the previous episode, the Israelis were ill-prepared for the simultaneous surprise attacks from the Syrians in the Golan Heights in the north and the Egyptians in the Sinai in the south. The Israeli losses in terms of manpower and territory and positions and materiel were staggering. In the north, the Syrians breached Israeli defenses and captured much of the Golan Heights. In the south, the Egyptians crossed through Suez Canal by the tens of thousands, smothered and bypassed the fortifications along the Bar Lev line and established very large and continually expanding bridgeheads on Israeli soil. The Israeli response, at least initially, was often confused, uncoordinated, insufficient, lackluster. The first counterattack in the south on Monday, October 8th, which was the third day of the war, it was premature. They didn't consolidate their plans and their power quite yet. It played right into the Egyptians' hands, and it was resoundingly repulsed. The next day, a second counterattack was launched by General Ariel Sharon, going a little bit as he is wont to do as a maverick on his own. He had retired from the military three months prior, and he was beckoned out of retirement and was given a division to lead in the south. And his counterattack on October 9th was also unsuccessful. And of course, he would go on towards the end of the war, to redeem himself in spectacular fashion. In the north, notwithstanding heroic and oftentimes brutal fighting by the Israelis, the overwhelming Syrian onslaught, it nearly marched into the Israeli heartland completely unopposed. If there was ever a time in Israel's history where it was on the brink of destruction, it was during the first few days of the Yom Kippur War. The disparity between the forces manning Israeli defenses on both fronts and the attacking Arab armies was gargantuan. In the north, Syria had dedicated its entire army to the war against Israel. It had 1,700 tanks and 1,300 field guns, artillery, Facing, at the time, there were only 177 tanks and only 44 artillery pieces on the Israeli side. And even though the initial wave of attacks, the Syrians only had uh, deployed 500 tanks and they would add an additional 300 tanks that evening, the rest of their army they had stationed in defensive positions. The difference in Infantry was similarly lopsided. There were 45,000 Syrian soldiers facing off against 5,000 Israeli soldiers in the north. In the south, in the Sinai, on the west bank, on the Egyptian side of the Suez Canal, Egypt had amassed five divisions totaling 100,000 soldiers, 1,300 plus tanks, 2,000 artillery pieces and heavy mortars for their onslaught. Facing them directly on the canal, like we spoke about last time, were 450 soldiers spread out along 16 forts along the Bar Lev line, straddling the length of the canal. And in all of Sinai, there were 8,500 Israeli soldiers and 290 tanks, though the absolute vast majority of of Israeli strength in the Sinai was nowhere near the canal when the war began. In terms of manpower and armor, the Israelis were in effect outnumbered 10 to 1 in both arenas of conflict on that fateful Yom Kippur day. Even if the Israelis were to, you know, each tank were to destroy three or four or five tanks, even if they won they'd still be outmatched, outnumbered, and facing steep disadvantages on the field of battle. And that was okay. After all, Israel had invested the majority of its military budget for its Air Force. And the plan was always to deploy the Air Force with tremendous strength 
the problem was that although Israel technically dominated the air, in the course of the first couple of days of the Yom Kippur War, their air supremacy was removed, was diminished due to the overwhelming Soviet-provided anti-aircraft defenses, and therefore they really had nothing. They didn't have more soldiers, they didn't have more tanks, they didn't have more artillery, and their air force was ineffective. On both the southern and northern fronts, the Israelis were, of course, decidedly outnumbered, but there were differences between the two fronts. Obviously, they're several hundred miles away from each other, and the operational settings are very different. In the south, the major difference, you have a canal, a great, vast body of water 600 feet wide separating the two enemies. In the north, there was no natural barrier between the Israelis and their Syrian counterparts. The de facto border between the two countries was at the ceasefire line of the Six-Day War, of the 1967 war. It was called the Purple Line. And if you know a little bit about the, the Middle East and Israel and its neighbors, they like to give color-coded names to their border. So you have the Purple Line between Israel and Syria, not to be confused with the 1949 armistice line with Jordan called the Green Line, not to be confused with the Blue Line when Israel withdrew from Lebanon in the year 2000. And between the two armies along the Purple Line, you had about a mile of no man's land. It was occupied and monitored by a team of United Nations observers Peacekeepers, of course, not very effective at doing that. The only thing physically separating the two opposing armies along this 45-mile border was an anti-tank ditch and, of course, the standard barbed wires and other defenses you'll find uh, along the border. The biggest defense that Israel had against an invading Syrian attacking onslaught was the fact that whatever attack units would have to come and uh, make an invasion into your territory that have to go through the anti-taint ditches and those precious minutes were essentially their best defense. Behind the ditch, they had constructed about 17 fortified observation posts, each one of them garrisoned by 20 men, supported by a tank platoon of three tanks apiece. Topographically, the Golan Heights did afford its defenders an advantage, of course, in every war setting to have the, the height advantage, to have the elevated position is to the defender's advantage. The Golan Heights, they're called the Heights because they are mountainous, they are elevated, and they offer a commanding view of both Israel and Syria, and essentially is the most dominant terrain in the area. Now, besides being beneficial with respect to observation, there was an additional benefit of being elevated in that the Israeli Sherman tanks, which already had a greater range than Syrian tanks, they had their range advantage amplified thanks to their elevated position on the Golan Heights. But the Syrian tanks, they had a different advantage. Uh, most of the Syrian tanks were equipped with infrared lights and scopes, and therefore during nighttime fighting, a lot of the fighting that happened in Syria happened between tanks at night. The Assyrians, in effect, they had uh, the tanks and themselves had, had vision. The Israeli officers and commanders on the tanks, they had, they wore vision goggles, but they couldn't see, in effect, past about a 100 yards, whereas the Syrian tanks had a tremendous advantage thanks to the infrared lights and scopes. There's another important difference between the northern front and the southern front, the distances between the front lines and the Israeli heartland, the strategic depth. In Israel, the motto always was that the first war that Israel loses will be the last war that it fights. The Arabs, they could afford to lose 
a war or two, 10,000 men here, 10,000 men there. It didn't really matter. Egypt had you know, 50, 60 million people. No big deal. They don't flinch at loss of manpower and they know that they're going to survive whatever, whatever the war brings to them, whatever any war brings to them. When Israel went to war, there was no option to lose. You couldn't lose and regroup and, you know, better luck next time. Its enemies would relish destroying the nation, the people, civilians and soldiers alike, pushing them into the water. That's what they've been overtly desiring since Israel's founding. But now, thanks to the territorial conquests of the Six-Day War, in the Sinai, Israel had acquired hundreds of miles of strategic depth for Egypt to attack Israel proper. They'd have to traverse hundreds of miles of barren desert. In addition, Israel had built extensive fortifications and defenses along the canal and additional lines of defense several miles behind the lines. By contrast, in the Golan Heights, they had exactly one defensive line, and the next defensible position for the Israelis was the west bank of the River Jordan. In effect, the Israeli defenses in the Golan was built almost with the understanding that it wouldn't be needed. Syria would not attack. The entire defense of the Golan and, moreover, the entire defense of the Galilee and of Haifa in the heart of Israel hinged on that one line of defense. There was no plan B. The problem was that all the Israeli defensive plans that was all predicated on the assumption that even if Syria would attack, they'd have... 72, maybe even more hours of foreknowledge of the attack in advance. And that, of course, allow Israel to call up its reserve army to mobilize and to reinforce the lines with strength in time for war. Now that they were undermanned when the war began, the only option that they had, given their lack of strategic depth, was to hold the line. This was the only option until reserves could be mobilized. There's no flexibility. There's no elasticity along their lines. They couldn't trade, you know, we'll give up some ground for time. They couldn't even do that. There's no ground to yield. They don't have strategic depth. Ironically, there was one positive benefit of that. You know, part of any war is a supply line. You have to supply your soldiers with with material, with equipment, with food, on a regular basis. And the further out you attack into the enemy, the longer your supply line is from your from your depots, from your headquarters onto the front lines. Without any strategic depth, Israel had a non-existent supply line. They were right there. Whereas the Egyptians and to some extent the Syrians as well, they outran their supply lines and that caused them uh, some headaches down the line. There's another difference between the two fronts, and that is with respect to the relative Israeli preparedness, readiness for war. Though the entirety of the Israeli military was put on alert level C, the highest level of alert, several days before the outbreak of the war, in the north, they were vastly more prepared than in the south. And that disparity is largely due to one of the Israeli commanders of the Golan, Colonel Avidor Bengal, soon to be General Bengal, and he emerged after the war as one of the great heroes from the Syrian front. In the run-up to the war, several weeks prior, he recognized, unlike the rest of the Israeli military and political establishment, and certainly the intelligence establishment, he recognized that war was imminent and he had begun to prepare his brigade. Without informing his superiors, he scouted, he tore the front lines. He had targets and firing tables for his tanks prepared. His tanks were deployed, ready to fire upon the attackers. When the war broke out, his brigade and his brigade alone, they were the only IDF unit in a state of full readiness. And that, of course, would be quite fortuitous because the Israelis were much more vulnerable in the north than they were in the south. 
Now, the Egyptian and Syrian alliance wasn't exactly one of equality. Egypt was in charge. They made the plans. They called the shots. They decided on the timelines. It was like a big brother, little brother relationship. In fact, they told the Syrians, we'll we'll let you know when the war happens. They only informed them of the date of the war a few days prior. The Syrians, they're attacking, of course, from east to west. So they want to attack at dawn when the sun is to their back and it's blinding the Israeli defenders. Egypt, because of course they had supremacy, and they would be attacking from the west side of the canal to the east side of the canal. So they didn't want to do in the morning. They wanted to wait till afternoon, till the sun is overhead or really even in in the west. And with no other choice, they decided on 2 p.m. as the time for the attack. Now, it's also important to stress, and this of course plays out in the war itself, that Syria and Egypt had different objectives and consequently different battle plans. Egypt, their plan was, let's cross over the canal, let's make a tremendous bridgehead, and then we'll figure out what happens from there. They recognized, as the Israelis did, that militarily they really weren't going to conquer all of Sinai, all of their lost territory from 1967. And therefore, the plan was to kind of break the impasse and get your foot on the other side of the canal and then proceed diplomatically. Syria, on the other hand, they had intended on conquering the entirety of the Golan, everything they lost in 1967, militarily during this war. And they had a plan for that. It was meticulously planned. And they had, of course, years to do that. And the plan called for capturing the Golan Heights and advancing to the Jordan River within 36 hours. Once they were firmly established on Israeli soil, the plan called for a regrouping and then further advance into the Galilee, into pre-1967 borders into Israel proper. The Syrians assumed that the complete mobilization of Israeli reserves would take about three days. By that time, they calculated that all the Golan would be in their hands. The Egyptians, they had much more limited objectives. They wanted, like we said, to cross over the Suez, establish a beachhead. They considered the crossing itself to be a major achievement on its own right, not just some sort of stepping stone to further incursions into Sinai, and certainly not as the beginning of a campaign to regain all of the Sinai. And this point, I think, is a central cause for the Israeli lack of preparation. The Egyptians did not believe that they had the capability to fully reconquer all of Sinai, and everyone knew that. The Americans knew that, the Israelis knew that, the Russians knew that, everyone knew that. But what was the conclusion from that bit of knowledge? The conclusion that the Israelis took was, well, they can conquer it, ergo, there won't be a war because Sadat would not embark on a war that he couldn't win militarily. That that conclusion was flawed. All they wanted to do was to shatter the Israeli invincibility to restore Egypt's wounded pride and to actually do the crossing. Now, initially, the Egyptians had estimated that they would suffer between 25,000 and 30,000 casualties during the crossing, including 10,000 dead. But they didn't realize how unprepared the Israelis were. In fact, the crossing resulted in only 208 Egyptian dead, far fewer than any Egyptian planner had estimated, and that set the stage for them biting off more than they could chew. They, once the first stage of the war was so successful, they pursued a much wider objective. They tried to penetrate deep into the Sinai, and those plans, the plans that weren't initially in the cards, those were the ones that were their undoing, and those largely failed. So the war began at 2 p.m. simultaneously along the Suez in the south and the Purple Line in the Golan in the south. Egypt had 
planned the crossing down to the most minute details, and in fact, they had executed it flawlessly. They began their assault with simultaneous air and artillery attacks. They flew 250 Egyptian planes, uh, so mids, mid-17, mid-19s, mid-21s, and they bombed all kinds of Israeli targets in the Sinai. They struck three Israeli airfields. They bombed surface-to-air missile batteries, Israeli command posts, artillery positions, and the largest of the Israeli fortifications along the Bar Lev line, nicknamed Budapest, which incidentally was the only fort not to fall during the Yom Kippur War. Meanwhile, 2,000 artillery pieces opened fire against all the strong points along the Bar Lev line, a barrage that lasted a staggering 53 minutes. In fact, it's one of the longest artillery barrages in history. They dropped 10,500 shells in the first minute of that barrage alone. Uh, Soldiers who were in the fortresses describe the ground literally shaking. In fact, I read an interview with one of the soldiers who were in the fortifications And he said the following, Around noon, we were suddenly shelled like hell. It was like an earthquake. The land moved. There were mushrooms of smoke. The air smelled like burned gunpowder. And I was all alone, stationed at the entrance of the outpost. I radioed for someone to take the guard post so that I could put on my boots, vest, and helmet to get my equipment. I didn't think it was war. I thought maybe it was a local attack, and in a few minutes it would stop. So the interviewer asked him, Okay, when did you realize that it was war? So he responded, a little bit later, I was stationed with another soldier who was about a meter away from me, and it was towards the evening, and the moonlight was very bright, and he's telling me about his life, how he came alone from Australia, he was living in Kibbutz de Eliyahu. In the middle of the conversation, he falls silent, and I turned to him, and I found him lying in a trench with a bullet in his head, dead. I didn't hear anything was a sniper shot across the Suez. War began simultaneously, but of course, not every soldier in these fortifications, they were kind of siloed off. They had no idea what was happening, and they didn't find out till later that it was indeed a simultaneous attack and a, an attempt to crossing all across the canal. In fact, the Israeli officers and the Israeli high command didn't know about it either. Egyptian tanks climbed the ramparts on the Egyptian side of the canal and began firing across the canal at Israeli fortresses. At 2.15, when the aircraft sent to bomb the Sinai, when they were returning from their missions, the first wave of 8,000 assault infantrymen began crossing the canal. It's about a distance of between six and 700 feet. Subsequently, in 1975, they widened the canal to make room for super tankers. At that time, it was about between between six and 700 feet. Of course, it's 100 miles long, so in some places, it's a little bit wider. Some places, it's a little bit narrower. The infantry began crossing the canal in rafts and dinghies and in various kinds of boats, pontoon boats. Some of them were even swimming. They had uh, smoke canisters released together with the fog of war to obscure the crossing. And the initial wave, their objective was to seize and hold the sand walls, the sand embankments on the Israeli side of the canal. When the second wave arrived, the first wave would advance several hundred yards, wait for the third and the fourth wave, and continually expand and grow the Egyptian bridgeheads with each successive wave. All told... Twelve waves of infantry crossed over during the first few hours of the war. And by 5.30, so three and a half hours into the war, there were 32,000 Egyptian men on the five bridgeheads, a little more than 6,000 men in each one. And each bridgehead was around six kilometers wide and two kilometers deep into the Sinai. And of course, once the Egyptians cross over, they begin their assault and they begin their preparations. They deployed tank hunting detachments. Of course, there's not a lot of Israeli tanks there, but they know that they're going to come. So they send out these groups of, of 10 soldiers equipped with RPGs and grenades and SAGR missiles, and they're mining 
the Israeli tank ramps. They're preparing anti-tank ambushes where they expect the reinforcements to come. They send specialized infantry units to begin assaulting the Israeli fortifications along the Bar Lev line. Uh, commandos begin attacking artillery batteries and command posts. Egyptian engineers, they begin breaching the minefields and the barbed wires surrounding the Israeli defenses. And the plan to begin the actual crossing of Egyptian armor begins. Egyptian engineers, they began transporting the water pumps across the canal to lay the groundwork for making the breaches in the sand walls to facilitate the laying down of the bridges that are going to enable the tanks to cross the canal. Meanwhile, as the assault begins, Israeli Southern Command, they're trying to pinpoint exactly what is this Egyptian attack, where is the main effort, and they, of course, are going to launch a counterattack. Within hours, it becomes clear that this is not a isolated attack. This is spanning the entirety of the canal. Even one part of the canal that was not really reinforced called the Great Bitter Lake. You look at a map, you'll see that there's in the middle of the canal, there's a huge lake. And it's so far that Israel never assumed that they would cross at that point and they never built fortifications. Even there, the Egyptians made a crossing. So when Israel discovered that this is a full-on assault, they began sending their tank brigades towards the canal region. But of course, they were ambushed because this was meticulously prepared by the Egyptians and the Israelis failed to conduct reconnaissance beforehand. Now, the worst fate of all the soldiers in the south befell the 450 poor souls trapped in the 16 fortresses along the canal. In the confusion ensuing the surprise assault, they didn't remember to evacuate the Bar Lev line garrison. And by the time they realized that that's our major problem, they were surrounded. Most of them, at least. Most of the fortifications were surrounded. And thus, these fortresses were transferred into traps, essentially. In many of these fortifications, the commanding officers were killed. Command was taken over by others. In one case, a private soldier assumed command. They, of course, are radioing in the headquarters pleading for air and artillery and armored support. Of course, the promise is on the way, but no help came to them unless they could be evacuated or if by some miracle the Egyptians were forced to withdraw to the other side of the canal, these soldiers were in grave danger. In the end, around half of the soldiers were killed and about 200 of them were taken as prisoners of war by the Egyptians. But the plight of the soldiers trapped in those forts had dominated a lot of the military's focus in the early days of the war. They couldn't really allow their fellow comrades to be encircled, to be trapped, to be besieged by the Egyptians. And they repeatedly launched counterattacks to try to liberate them. But they just ran into these aggressive Egyptian ambushes and losing many men and many tanks. In subsequent days... Some defenders of the Bar Lev line, they managed to break through the Egyptian encirclement and return to the Israeli lines. And some were also extracted during the Israeli counterattacks that came later, but the majority of them were either dead or taken captive. Now, it's important to note that not all the people who were in those forts were experienced soldiers. In fact, many of them were not even soldiers at all. Remember, this is Yom Kippur. And all the outposts had religious soldiers who wanted a pray Yom Kippur. So they imported yeshiva students and other people to serve as chazanim, to serve as cantors for the Yom Kippur prayers. Remember, no one knows that war is happening, or at least most people didn't know it. So you have this mix of some veteran soldiers, some recent immigrants, some yeshiva students, and they're all trapped in the fortress, surrounded outnumbered 200 to 1 by 
attacking Egyptian forces and there's no really there's no help for you. As an aside, and we'll talk more about this in the future episode, the hundreds of Israelis who were taken captive by the Egyptians, they underwent nightmarish torture and beatings. And we now know that many prisoners of war were actually killed by the Egyptians. But the war crimes of the Egyptians were dwarfed by those committed by the Syrians, the Arabs that for some reason have the most virulent hatred for Israel and the ones who possess the most violent, the most sadistic, the most brutal character and treatment of prisoners of war. But more about Syria in a second. With the five Egyptian bridgeheads secure, the Egyptian engineers began breaching the sand walls on the Israeli side to lay down bridges in order to transport tanks and other vehicles. Though they only made 12 or so bridges, they clear between 60 and 80 passages, the counts differ, through the sound wall, each wide enough for tanks to traverse. Uh, the reason why they did more breaches in the sand than they needed for the bridges was because that everyone knew that these Transport bridges that spanned the canal, these were the vital link for Egyptian supplies and Egyptian transport. And everyone knew that the Israelis would try to destroy the bridges as soon as possible, which would, of course, not allow any more armor and materiel to cross over, but it would also sever the Egyptian supply lines and the escape route, trapping the Egyptians that were already on the other side of the, of the Suez. Therefore, the Egyptians, they made many decoy bridges, fake bridges, alongside actual bridges to confuse the Israeli attacks. In fact, many of the bridges that were destroyed by the Israelis were not real bridges. They were decoys. In addition, the bridges were periodically relocated to confuse Israeli airstrikes targeting them. Now, the way they built these bridges, there were sectional bridges, compartmentalized bridges. And that, of course, allowed them to be disassembled and put up someplace else, but also it helped the Egyptians because if Israelis would attack a bridge, they'd just repair that section or replace that section, but you wouldn't need to replace the entire bridge. Now, to make each breach in the sand walls, the engineers had to remove at at a minimum 2,000 cubic yards of sand, which is a staggering amount of sand. Initially, In the early 70s, when Egypt was in the planning stages of the war, they tried conventional methods, bulldozers and explosives, and they tested those as means to breach in the sand wall. Turns out it took too long, required too many people. It wasn't practical. In the end, they found a simple but ingenious solution. They used small gasoline-fueled water cannons that pumped jets of water from the canal itself. And within two hours, you could have three guys that could blast a hole through the sand barrier. In the northern sector of the canal, where the Egyptian second army was crossing, the plan worked perfectly. In the southern sector, where the Egyptian third army was crossing, the walls were a little bit wider. And the consistency of the soil was such that instead of disintegrating, it turned into mud. So they had a little bit more of a difficult time in the south. But ultimately, sufficient breaches were completed and bridges were installed. The Israeli Air Force conducted operations to try to prevent the bridges from being erected. But the Egyptian anti-aircraft surface-to-air batteries deployed along the canal, they stifled the Israeli pilots and the bridges that were damaged were quickly repaired. Once the bridges were laid... Additional infantry with the remaining portable and recoilless anti-tank weapons began to cross the canal. And at 8.30 that evening, six and a half hours into the war, the first Egyptian tanks began rolling across the canal. Throughout the night and into the following morning, tanks and vehicles and reinforcements kept on crossing. The traffic was considerable. They actually had military police directing traffic. There was so much traffic and so much congestion along these bridges. By the following morning, 50,000 Egyptian soldiers 
and 850 Egyptian tanks had crossed the canal. They had established five bridgeheads, each one around five miles in depth, and they had reorganized and entrenched themselves in anticipation of Israeli counterattacks. Now, the Egyptians were hesitant to go too far away from the canal because once they ventured outside of the protective umbrella of the anti-aircraft batteries, they were vulnerable And indeed, the ones that did venture out were swiftly destroyed by Israeli planes. But so long as they stuck close to the canal, they were safe. In the initial phases of the war, the vaunted forts of the Bar Lev line failed miserably. The units inside were trapped. Many had died. They were low on ammo. They were being mercilessly pummeled by the attackers. Though they fought bravely, they fought valiantly. The survivors were in a precarious predicament. They had no backup. They had no support. The SAM missiles were destroying Israeli planes by the dozen. They just couldn't penetrate the anti-aircraft wall with any consistency. Any groups of tanks or infantry that did manage to penetrate the bridgeheads to reach the canal zone, to try to destroy the bridges or to rescue those that were trapped, those were thwarted. The first day of the war was an unmitigated catastrophe for the Israelis in the southern front. The northern front did not fare much better. At two in the afternoon, on the sixth day of October, Yom Kippur, a 50-minute Syrian artillery barrage commenced. Under the cover of the attack, the Syrians began their approach towards the anti-tank ditch, clearing mines, clearing obstacles, and advancing bridge layer tanks to cross over the ditches. The Israeli tanks atop the prepared ramps managed to pick off many Syrian tanks, and particularly, of course, focusing on the bridging tanks, the uh, the engineering tanks. But the sheer mass of the Syrian attack strained the thin Israeli lines. Outnumbered 10 to 1, 15 to 1 in some places, having one tank deployed on the battlefield for every 18 attacking tanks, the odds of them keeping the line were stacked against them. The Air Force was called into action, but thanks to this dense Soviet-made anti-aircraft wall, many planes were shot down. A desperate four-day battle to prevent the Syrians from penetrating Israel in the region that became known as the Valley of Tears began. The Israeli forces, massively outnumbered, massively outgunned, could not afford to yield an inch to the bloodthirsty invaders. Concurrent with the assault on the Purple Line, a Syrian parachute battalion launched an assault on the strategically vital electronic warfare outpost atop Mount Hermon. From their post atop Israel's highest mountain, the Israelis were able to see all the way to Haifa on the Mediterranean coast, to Damascus in the west, and the entirety of all the battlefields. And beyond being an excellent observation post, it was also a natural place for radar equipment and other sensitive electronics. Despite its critical importance, its fortifications were incomplete and were neglected and it was criminally undermanned. It only had 13 soldiers plus an officer there. And the ones that were there were armed with insufficient weaponry. Of the four Syrian helicopters loaded with commandos, the Israelis managed to shoot down one. The other three of them landed on the mountain peak about a mile from the Israeli position. And that afternoon, the position fell. For the remainder of the war... The Israelis were nearly blind to the battlefield, having lost this vital outpost. The first Israeli attempt on the 8th of October to retake the base from the south, it was ambushed, it was beaten off with heavy losses, and the Israelis only managed to recapture it towards the very end of the war on October 22nd. Back in the arena of battle in the valley, a small number of Israeli troops were fighting a desperate, heroic, and miraculous battle 
for the survival of the state and for the safety of its heartland. Late in the first night, after a brutal day of fighting, the Syrians managed to break through the defenses. And on the second day of the war, they had captured much of the southern portion of the Golan Heights. The Syrian infantry, they widely employed RPGs and Sagar missiles against Israeli armor and infantry vehicles, knocking out tank after tank. At one point, the situation became so desperate that there were officers with no tanks trying to shoot bazooka guns and machine guns at Syrian tanks. Many Israeli tank commanders were also killed as they stood out of the turrets of their tanks. In fact, the commander of all the forces in the south of the Golan, Brigadier General Yitzhak ben Shoham, he, together with his deputy commander, together with the operations officer, they were all killed in the second day of the battle. But the Syrian arena in particular, it was a place where many people stepped up. When one commander went down, someone else stepped up, and it is a story that involves a lot of heroes. So, for example, you have Avigdor Kahalani. He commanded the 77th Armored Battalion of the uh, 7th Brigade on the Golan Heights. And with only 27 tanks at his disposal, his battalion managed to hold the line for 36 hours against literally hundreds of Syrian tanks. After the war, he was awarded the Medal of Valor Itur Hagvura, the highest Israeli military decoration. In fact, since 1973, since the Yom Kippur War, there have not been any of this award given to any Israeli soldier. Another great hero of the battle was Svika Greengold. This guy, he hunted down and destroyed at least 20 Syrian tanks. Some accounts have him at 60 tanks destroyed that had already penetrated the Israeli lines and were advancing unopposed. He fought these battles, sometimes just him in a tank, for 20 hours straight as if he was an entire company of tanks. In fact, when he radioed back to the headquarters, he's like, yeah, we have a whole – he didn't tell them it was just him. Him going up, uh, going up against dozens upon dozens of Syrian tanks and knocking them all out one after another. And whenever his tank was destroyed, he would just swap it for a different tank. And he would do these complex maneuvers to make it seem, to make it appear that there was more than just one tank. He suffered burn injuries on his face and his arm, but he stayed in action and repeatedly showed up at critical moments from an unexpected direction and changed the course of the battle. He too was awarded the Medal of Honor. In fact, as we know, the Golan Heights, they were in the news recently. A few months ago, in March of 2019, President Trump was the first to recognize Israel's sovereignty over the Golan. They had conquered the Golan in 1967. They had annexed the Golan in 1981, but it was not internationally recognized until... March of 2019. And in fact, this year, when Mike Pence, the vice president, when he spoke at the APAC policy conference, he told over the story of Tzvika Greengold in his speech. I'll read a part of his speech here. For 20 years after Israel's rebirth, Syria held the Golan Heights. And with its massive artillery, it held Israel hostage. This crucial region changed hands only after Israel won a war that was forced upon her, years later, referring to the Yom Kippur War, when Israel's enemies attacked her on the holiest day of the Jewish year. Thousands of patriots stepped up to defend their homeland, including a young tank commander who single-handedly kept a fleet of enemy tanks at bay, the great Tzvika Greengold. It's an amazing story. Late one night, all alone on the Tapline route, as enemy tanks rolled into Israel, a miracle happened. This is again Mike Pence speaking. Captain Greengold moved his lone tank back and forth in the darkness, firing in different directions to confound and delay 
a far larger enemy force. His actions not only helped turn the tide of the battle in Israel's favor, they secured the Golan Heights from enemy control and with it saved the state of Israel from the brink of disaster. Then he goes on to talk about how no one did anything about it until President Trump took action. And this was the same day, actually, that the decision was announced to formally recognize Israel's sovereignty over the Golan Heights. The bravery and the miraculous stand of these heroes notwithstanding, the situation in the Golan was critical. In the late night, General Hofi informed the Defense Minister Moshe Dayan that an estimated 300 Syrian tanks had entered the southern Golan. There were no reserves to stop this incursion. And almost inexplicably, on Sunday night, so this is... 36 hours into the war, they decided to stop. The Syrians were close to reaching Israeli defenders at Nefech, an important crossroads in the middle of the Golan Heights. It's also an Israeli command center. And they just stopped in the middle of the day, five in the afternoon. And they just stood there all night, allowing Israeli forces to form a defensive line. It's one of the great mysteries of the war. Why did they stop? Why did they pause? Why did they allow the Israelis to build defense lines? They could have waltzed in to Israel. No one would have stopped. There was no tanks to stop them. It was just nothing but daylight between them and the Mediterranean Sea. So some have suggested that the Syrians, you know, they had a rigid, inflexible Soviet doctrine of war, it's kind of very top-down, and they were not great at improvising. And they had a plan, okay, at this time we reach this point, and then we don't go too far ahead of schedule. So some have suggested that they just didn't want to diverge from their plan. Others have suggested that maybe they suspected an ambush. But in retrospect, it's clearly a miracle. They just stopped. There was no defense between them And the Galilee, between them and Haifa, they just stopped in time for reinforcements to arrive. But even though they had stopped, the war was not over, the battle was not over, it was still very critical. The situation was still exceedingly grave. The Syrians were already deep into the Golan, and they seemed to have had a great advantage. Reservists had to be shuttled to both fronts, which of course was its own logistical nightmare. You have soldiers scattered around the whole country and you're trying to get them to the front lines and moving to all the tanks. And of course, at times of war, everything's mobilized to help the war effort. There was civilian buses that were chartered uh, to move tanks. I spoke to my father. He had just finished basic training. My father was in the army at the time, but he was in the United States. He was on leave because he was getting engaged to my mother, so he had arrived in New York a few weeks prior. And in fact, on Yom Kippur, he had spent that Yom Kippur in the Philadelphia yeshiva with his with his uncle, who was the head of the yeshiva. And that's when the war began. And he told me that he remembers being woken up and being told that, oh, a war had begun. And of course, he's a soldier, and he's 6,000 miles away. So after, after Yom Kippur, he called the Israeli embassy in New York. And he had to find out, do I need to hustle back to Israel? I said, no, you could stay as long as the leave that you were granted from your officer and go back when, when it's time for you to go back. So after the, the festival of Sukkot, still in the middle of the war, he flew back to Israel. And he lands in the airport And the guy who stamps his passport says, okay, there is a transport truck waiting for you outside. Go jump in the truck. So he tells me, he's like, no, 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 I just, I I went outside. Okay, sir, sir. I went outside, I took a taxi and went home. So I guess he disregarded that. And I assume the guy's still looking for him. Who knows? So Israel is mobilizing her reserves. And by Monday, by October 8th, The reserves had arrived on both fronts and they were deployed at full wartime numbers, at least with respect to manpower. With respect to materiel, their numbers were greatly diminished. And at the time, the Syrians, 
and the Egyptians had already been receiving rearmaments from the Soviets and the Americans had yet to okay any aid, any military aid to Israel. At the time, three days into the war, Egypt had consolidated the five division-sized bridgeheads into two army-sized bridgeheads. They had 90,000 men and nearly a 1,000 tanks, and they're dug in, they're entrenched, they're waiting for the Israelis to counterattack. At this time, they're already 10 miles inland. These are very large beachheads. The Israelis had retreated to about 19 miles east of the canal. Of course, there's still a few soldiers trapped in the fortresses in the Bar-Lev line. And the Israeli forces in the Sinai are divided into three divisions. You have Avraham Adan, that one general who was deployed in the northern sector, the great Ariel Sharon in the central sector, and Albert Mandler in the southern sector. And they began to plan a counterattack, which turned out to be a devastating failure. The Israelis underestimated the number of of Egyptian tanks by 500. In fact, they thought they had more tanks when they had fewer. The division commanders, they didn't follow the plan in sync with each other. Adan's divisions, they, they maneuvered incorrectly and ended up being trapped and ambushed and losing 100 tanks. The following day, defined orders from the chief of the Southern Command, Shmuel Gonen, ostensibly his superior, even though he had just himself relinquished that job three months prior. Ariel Sharon launched another brigade side attack to retake a defensive position lost the previous day. And despite the initial success of that mission, he was eventually repulsed by the end of the day. He had no gains and he lost around 60 tanks in the process. This was, in effect, insubordination on Sharon's part. So Gonen, who was the head of the Southern Command, he's furious at Sharon. They didn't like each other to begin with. And he asked David Lazar, the chief of staff, to fire him. So David Lazar did fire someone, but he fired Gonen, not Sharon. He fired Gonen, and he appointed former Chief of Staff Chaim Barlev, regarding whom the eponymous Barlev line is named after, as his replacement. So in the middle of the war, three days into four days into the war, Shmuel Gonen is, is replaced. After the war was over, the Agronaut Commission was convened to figure out who's to blame, and Gonen was excoriated. This is a direct quote from the report. He failed to fulfill his duties adequately and bears much of the responsibility for the dangerous situation in which our troops were caught. He himself resigned from the IDF in 1974. He went to Africa. He embarked on various business ventures. He almost never came back to Israel. He even wanted to kill Moshe Dayan. In a comprehensive book on the war, called the Yom Kippur War, written by Abraham Rabinovich. He has a kind of a sad and tragic description of what happened to Shmuel Gonin afterwards. I want to read it to you here. The most tragic figure to emerge in the Israeli military hierarchy from the war was Shmuel Gonin. The ignominy of being superseded as commander of the Southern Front at the height of the war was compounded by being forced to leave the army after the final Agronaut report. Although the Israeli establishment usually finds suitable jobs for retired generals, he was offered none. Gonin believed Dayan had been responsible for his disgrace and would tell reporters that he had considered walking into Dayan's office and shooting him. Instead, he spent 13 years in the jungles of the Central African Republic searching for diamonds with the intention, he said, of becoming wealthy enough to hire the best lawyers in Israel to prove the Agronaut findings mistaken and to clear his name. He reportedly made and lost one or two fortunes, but rejected appeals by his family and friends to abandon his obsession. A reporter who visited him in the jungle after nine years found him somewhat mellowed, self-aware, and not without sardonic humor, and still sprinkling his conversations with apt quotes from the Talmud. The tough soldier appeared to find satisfaction in coping with the brutal challenges of the jungle rather than nursing his grievances in the cafes of Tel Aviv. He died of a heart attack in 1991 during one of his periodic trips to Europe. 
Among the few possessions returned to his family were maps of the Sinai, on which he had apparently refought the war during his general exile, a copy of a Kabbalistic work in which the former yeshiva student may have sought explanations for the disaster that had overtaken him beyond what the maps could tell. So he kind of went crazy uh, and it seems like he was blamed for the war, whether it was just or not, who knows, but the conclusions of the Agronath Commission were dubious by any account. So by October 9th, and certainly by October 10th, the front on both sides really settled into a stalemate. And on October 9th, the Prime Minister, Golda Meir, she convened a top-level discussion in the cabinet. The cabinet and the military establishment, they were at a loss regarding how to proceed. You know, more Israelis died on the first day of the Yom Kippur War than during the entirety of the Six-Day War. And they were really not prepared. The Arab soldiers were fighting with determination, with discipline, with tenacity. They were well-equipped. They were well-trained. These weren't the same armies that Israel faced in 1967. The Israeli ammunitions were depleted. Hundreds of their tanks were smoldering. The Air Force was largely ineffective and had lost many planes. Egypt had nearly 100,000 soldiers on Israeli soil, and every attempt to dislodge them had failed. Syria was deep in the Golan and bearing overwhelmingly superior strength in terms of manpower and weaponry. Defense Minister Moshe Dayan, he made a prediction that terrified everyone. He thought that Jordan would join in the battle in Israel's center, opening up a third front. He famously lamented the fact that the third Jewish kingdom, the state of Israel, is going to be destroyed. There's a direct quote that we have from the minutes of this meeting. Dayan said, the fight is over the entire land of Israel, meaning not just the Sinai and the Golan. Even if we withdraw from the Golan Heights, this would not solve anything. And the Prime Minister, she agrees, says there's no reason why the Arabs would stop. They've already tasted blood. And Dayan, he added that their intention is to conquer Israel, to eliminate the Jews. Defense Minister Dayan, he offered to resign but Golda Meir rebuffed him. He recommended to withdraw deep into the Sinai. That was not pursued. The previous day, something unprecedented happened. Prime Minister Golda Meir decided to activate Israel's nuclear arsenal. According to many sources, of course, the Israelis never confirmed or denied the existence of their nukes, nor their deployment. But according to many sources, she had ordered the assembly and the arming of 13 nuclear bombs, and there was a plan in place, a doomsday plan of of what to do in case the entire nation, the people, was uh, really had their backs to their wall. And in the minutes of the October 9th meeting, of course, using coded language and, the, and such, the senior Israeli leaders, they brought up the idea of using these nuclear weapons. And it's been suggested post facto that the nuclear alert was, on one hand, a precaution in case things got worse, but also it helped restrain the Soviets from taking too much of a decisive action. But also it convinced the Americans that this was serious. The Americans thought, and really the Israelis themselves thought, that this was the same Arab armies of 1967. That, yes, maybe they have initial successes, but very quickly the war was going to turn, and they tried, and every counterattack failed. And this was serious. And the material loss was significant. They didn't really have enough to turn the tide. And By Israel going on nuclear alert, the Americans really realized that this is serious and the reports that came out later suggest that indeed it was successful, that the Egyptians got the message, the Soviets got the message, and the Americans, especially Kissinger, they 
he realized that this is, this is very serious and that helped uh, precipitate and expedite the massive Israeli resupply. Golda Meir, she wanted to secretly fly to Washington to beg Nixon for a resupply. Kissinger, in his book, he flatly rejected the idea. He said, you know, middle of war, the strong you know, iron lady of Israel is going to leave and fly to, and fly to Washington. It's hysterical. It's blackmail. It's going to encourage the Arab states to join the war as well. It doesn't look good for the Israelis. But the situation was quite dire. After four days of fighting, Israel was on the brink. Its future was very much in jeopardy. Its losses up to that point were unimaginable. But the war did see a stunning turnaround. When all was said and done, the Israelis would emerge as the clear victors, at least from a military perspective, certainly not from any other perspective, not diplomatically, not politically. I look forward to telling the story of the Israeli turnaround in the next episode of the Jewish History Podcast. If you enjoy the Jewish History Podcast, please rate it on Apple Podcasts, share it with a friend. My email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. I look forward to hearing from you.